Hello folks, my name is Lucas Mann. I'm the pastor of the Spring Church and I come out here with other brothers and sisters in the Lord to preach to you the gospel of Jesus Christ, to bring to you the word of the cross. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. The word of the cross is the, the dynamite, the, the dynamos, which is the Greek word where we get the word dynamite from. It's the explosive, life-changing power of God for salvation. Friends, we come out here because we care for your souls. We care for where you're going to go when you die. And we want you to have the assurance of glory that you're going to enter into heavenly glory when you pass from this life. It's coming. The day of your standing before God is coming. We want you to be, to be pure and perfect in the eyes of God through the work of Jesus Christ. We want you to be wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus the Messiah, the minister or the mediator of the new covenant, the one who brings salvation to those who are lost. Jesus said in Luke 19:10, "For the Son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost." Jesus Christ came to save sinners, among whom I am foremost, among whom I am the foremost. We come out here preaching to you not out of a prideful spirit, thinking we ourselves are better, but knowing we are worse off than you, but that God in His mercy has rescued us from the sewer of iniquity, the sea of sin, the bath of botchery. And God has raised us to spiritual life. He has removed the veil which is over our eyes that Satan has placed there. He's removed it and given us eyes to behold the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that is what we seek to do, is to preach the gospel so that you behold the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ by the grace of God and for the glory of God. The text of Scripture to which I would like to direct your attention to is Romans chapter 1, verse 28. And it is the first part of this verse. And the Apostle Paul writes these words. It says, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind. And the subject matter of this sermon is the subject of total depravity. That man is in the state of utter absolute inability to come to Christ to believe the gospel and to do anything that is pleasing to God. All men outside of Christ are dead in sin. They are absolutely unable to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, you could ter term this doctrine absolute inability. For there is no way that someone in the flesh can come to Christ for that is something which is pleasing to God. Jesus Himself said in John 6, 44, He said, No one can come to Me unless the Father who sent Me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. They are unable to do anything which pleases God. People think themselves to perhaps be generically good, or they might confess that there is evil within them, but they say that there's still some good. Maybe down, deep down within their soul, there is good. But I say no, and the Scriptures say no. There is nothing good within the heart of man. There is nothing good within the soul of man. Man is dead in sin, unable to please God. He's hostile toward God, as Romans 8 says. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Dear friends, there's not an island of righteousness left within any of us. Not a single one of us have an ounce of goodness. We are all evil, and we, that is why Christ came to save. That is why Christ came to save from sin, to save sinners from their sin, that they might not perish in their iniquities. There is no good in us. Romans 3, verse 10. This is what the Bible says, sir. There is none righteous. There is no not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asp is under their lips. 
whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That is the state of sinners who are totally depraved. And that is why Christ had to come into the world to save sinners, to save dead people. Maybe many of you like to show the walking dead. Well, the walking dead are all around you tonight. Those who are outside of Christ are the walking dead. For they are spiritually dead in the inside and unable to be raised to spiritual life. And But I, I praise God that Jesus Christ is in the business of raising dead people to life. Jesus Christ is in the business of taking people who are dead in their sins and raising them up, saying, come forth, Lazarus, from the tomb. And they come forth. Specifically here in Romans 1, the context of this passage is Paul's exposition of the Gospel. Romans 1.16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the Gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. That's, the Paul, that's what Paul's entire book of Romans is about. The exposition of the Gospel, the explanation, the unpacking of the Gospel truth. But before he brings the good news of the Gospel, that's what the Gospel means. It means good news. The Greek word, euangelion, good tidings. The Greeks used that term whenever a king or a kingdom would have victory in war. They used it to, to discuss and to reference the good tidings of victory over their enemies in battle. My friends, the greatest war has been won by the Lord Jesus Christ. He has conquered death. He has conquered the, the, the effect of sin, which is eternal damnation. He has paid for sin in His perfect death on the cross. And He has raised right. Himself up from the grave. That is the Gospel. That is the good news. Jesus Christ is Savior. And He saves sinners from their sins. That is the heart of the Gospel message. But before you see the good news, you must grasp the bad. You must see the bad news. And so Paul begins his exposition in verse 18. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. He begins with the bad news that God's wrath is revealed from heaven and God is angry with the wicked every day. He hates those who do wickedness. One must understand the depth and the gravity of God's wrath and hatred for sin and God's holiness before they see the mercy and love of God as they are revealed in the Gospel. One must see the wrath of God before they can consider and contemplate the grace of God. <laughs> Friends, I, I want you to understand the bad news before you see the good. For me, just to tell you the good news would be like a doctor telling his patients all the treatment options for their various diseases, but not telling them first about their diseases. A skillful doctor first begins by telling his patients all the things that are wrong with them and then he brings to them, to their attention, the ways in which they can be healed, the cure to their illness. And so too do I desire to first begin to tell you about your illness. But much more than an illness it is, my friends, you're dead in sin, blinded by the, the enemy, blinded by Satan children of the devil and you must be saved through Christ don't lose your soul for your sin no sin is worth an eternity in hell for for the pleasure of sin is momentary it's just for a moment it comes and it goes but hell's torments are eternal and so after verse 18, Paul just further unpacks the bad news of man's fallen state, God's righteous wrath, and the judgment thereof. He just continues and continues and continues in those verses. 
until we find ourselves in verse 28. The verse which speaks to total depravity. Which is the subject that I desire to cover this evening. And that is the subject of total depravity. So let us behold that. Look at what he says in verse 28. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, the sinner spends his entire life, his waking days, doing what? Resisting the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does the sinner find himself doing day after day? It is resisting, actively resisting, the authority of Jesus Christ over his or her life. Interestingly enough, the Bible states Jesus Christ is Lord of all. He is Lord over all people. It does not matter whether you confess the name of Jesus Christ or not, whether you believe in Christ or not, whether you've even heard the name of Jesus Christ or not. He is your Lord. He is your God. And He is your King. He is the King of glory. And the wicked, totally depraved sinners are actively resisting that Lordship. Listen to Psalm 2. It says, Why do the nations, why are the nations, excuse me, in an uproar, and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the, uh, the, the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then He will speak to them in His anger and terrify them in His fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my King upon Zion, my holy mountain. The Lordship of Jesus Christ is over all. The Kingship of Christ is over all. His Kingdom has no limits, has no bounds. It is an everlasting Kingdom. Indeed, it is an everlasting, an eternal Kingdom. And it cannot be overthrown by the plotting of men. And so it is a foolish act. It is a foolish thing to set oneself up against the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. To reject the knowledge which one has about God inherently. See, my friends, everyone knows the God of glory. They know the God of Scripture. They know His attributes. They know His character. They know who He is. But they reject Him. They reject it in their unrighteousness. They reject it in their sin and in their unholiness. No one is ignorant of God's existence, of God's being, and God's authority. No one is ignorant, sir. No one is ignorant of God's authority. No one is ignorant of this fact. And that is why the text reads, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, this seems to speak to the fact that there was a time in which they perhaps did acknowledge God. They acknowledged God at some point. And that's interesting. That speaks to where we find ourselves here in the Bible Belt. Here in the Bible Belt, what do we find? Person after person after person who claims to be a Christian. Yet they are drunkards. Yet they are sexually immoral. Yet they are proud and self-righteous. Yet they are rebellious. And they say themselves to be followers of Jesus Christ. That's a foolish state to be in. To say that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. To say that you're a Christian. Yet to act as though Christ never gave you a law to obey. You're a hypocrite if you say you're a Christian and you live in that way. That you live in that manner. I was a false convert for eight years. I said I was a Christian, but I was a hypocrite. I lived in a way. I lived in a manner that was hypo hypocritical, that was evil and wicked and perverse. I lived in a way that God hated, but I did not care. It was of no concern to me that I did not live in obedience to Scripture. But my friends, that exposed the evil of my heart. That just showed how much I truly hated God. That I was an actual hypocrite. And if you claim to be a follower of Christ this evening, if you've had an emotional experience, you've prayed the prayer, you've walked the aisle, a preacher told you you're saved, a Southern Baptist preacher told you you're saved, I don't care. That's not what it's about. 
It's about whether you are changed day by day. Is God doing a work in your life? Are you a new creation? Because there are a certain type of people that acknowledge God for a time, but they cease to acknowledge Him any longer. As the text reads, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, you may say you're a Christian, but it is about whether you bear fruit. We do not work to be saved. Our works are not the, the cause of salvation, but our works prove and evidence whether we have been saved. Let, I need, you need to understand this. this is so imperative and so important, especially because we find ourselves in the biblical South. Christianity is everywhere, supposedly. Not a biblical Christianity, though. A pseudo-Christianity, a, a false Christianity, a one that says you can say you're a Christian and live however you want. Because once saved, always saved, right? Wrong. If you're saved, it's true that you'll always be saved. But the evidence of a genuine salvation is life change, is obedience, is love toward the Lord Jesus Christ and love toward one's neighbor. That's the evidence of a genuine conversion. And if you don't have that, you never had a genuine conversion. You never were genuinely, truly, fully, soundly saved. You were just religiously deceived. You became religious. You, be, you got the outward trappings of religion, but you never had the inward reality of saving faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That is what the Gospel is. The finished work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. You young men and young women, the Bible says, remember the Lord in your youth. Consider the things of God while you are young. Follow the Lord Jesus Christ even as you're young. Jesus said, let the children come to me and do not permit the, do not do not prohibit the children from coming to me. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you folks. Jesus said, the, ki the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Humble yourself, you adults, as little children. Humble yourselves. But as I was saying, you hypocrites who say you're a Christian, stop it. Stop saying you're a Christian. Stop it because you're making it hard for me. You're making it hard for me and all genuine Christians to share the gospel with other people. Because the name of God is blasphemed in this world because of you and your hypocrisy. People don't want to have anything to do with Christianity because of false Christians. Because of hypocrites who say they're Christians. So stop it. Just renounce your Christianity. If you say you're a Christian and you do not live in accordance to what Jesus Christ says a genuine Christian is to be like, stop it. Go to everyone you ever said you were a Christian to and tell them you're not makes it easier for me and it, it and it it lessens your blaspheming God's name because that's blasphemy of God's name to take God's name upon yourself for that is what it means to be a Christian you take the name of Christ upon yourself and you say I am a little follower of Christ and then to trample it underfoot to walk as a hypocrite I'm not saying you must be perfect but I'm saying, what is the direction? What is the thrust of your life? What is your life's focus? I'm not perfect, but I know this. My life's direction is focused on following the Lord Jesus Christ. By the grace of God alone, is it like that? Friends, what is your life focused on? Is it focused on yourself or the glory of Jesus Christ? Help me. My, my brother's here. He'd love to talk with you. I'm going to continue to preach because people need to hear. But this brother would love to talk with you. I'd, lo I, I'd love to. I just cannot. I cannot stop because there's many people who need to hear the message. Hey, he, he's going to say what I'll say. Okay. And so the text continues. It says, God gave them over to a depraved mind. And that is the mind. That is the mind of those who are outside of Christ. See, if you are an unbeliever, you have a depraved mind. In other words, you have an a lack of ability to understand spiritual things. You have a lack of ability to ascertain spiritual things.
And so, man who is outside of Christ, a woman who is outside of Christ, has a depraved mind that is hostile toward God. As Romans 8 says, he says in verse 6 of Romans 8, the Apostle Paul says, For the mind set on the flesh is death. Is death. That's the mind of the ungodly. It's set on, on things which are perverse and wicked. So God gave them over to that. Who is this God of whom I speak? Who is this God of whom I reference and continue to preach concerning? He is Yahweh of hosts. He is the God of glory. See, my friends, you must understand the character of God. God is a holy and just judge. The Bible tells us in the book of Genesis, He is a just judge. The judge of all the earth. He is good. That's the most terrifying truth about God in Scripture. He is good. Because we're not. Because we're evil. That's, that's terrifying. That God is good and we are not. God is morally perfect. He has no imperfection in His moral character. Oh, dear friends. Oh, my dear friends. I say that because I love you and care for you. I certainly would not stand on a street corner on a Friday night and do this if I did not care for you. Make myself look like a fool in public for your sake. I care for you enough to say this. That God is a holy God. Deuteronomy 4.24 For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Listen, God is so holy, so just, and so pure. It is true that God is gracious and loving. We see it every day. Look how gorgeous the weather is even tonight. Beautiful evening here in Greenville. That testifies to the grace and mercy and kindness of God, even to you who are wicked. Even to the wicked, God is kind. But my friends, that never negates God's holiness. That never negates God's righteousness. See, the word holy means to be set apart. It means to be sacred. God is set apart from all that is evil and from all that is wicked and from all that is perverse. God is set apart from that, my friends. And that is of great fear for the ungodly because they cannot enter into God's presence. Sin cannot dwell in God's presence. Genesis Chapter 6 says these words. In verse 5 it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great upon the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God sees evil. He's omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent. He sees everything. He's all places, my friends. God sees even the thoughts of your own heart. And God has given His law. God has given His commandments, the Ten Commandments, for the children of men to obey. For the children of men to walk in accordance to. See, God has not only stated in His Word that He is holy, but He has put it on display by giving the law, by giving His very commands. As Exodus 20 says, God says to the Israelites in Exodus 20 verse 2, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. That's idolatry. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. God is jealous for His own glory and He hates idolatry. He hates when people worship the creation rather than the Creator. Or when they worship a false God whom they have, they have made in their own mind according to their own desires. God said also in verse 7, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. And the Bible says, and the Bible says God is holy in doing that. He's just in doing that. He will absolutely hold the wicked accountable for their sin. That's why it says you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. People all the time blaspheme God. The Bible says in Galatians 6, God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. 
Whatever you sow, you're going to reap, friends. And that is great fear for the ungodly because they work wickedness day after day after day. And so, and God in His mercy though has provided salvation in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why you must believe on Him for eternal life. That is why you must trust in the finished work of Christ. Otherwise, you will die in your sins. You'll be thrown into hell. But listen, he continues. God says in verse 13 of Exodus 20, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. These all show us the character of God. These all show us the character of God. God says you shall not lie. Why? Because He's not a liar. God says you shall not steal because He's not a thief. God says you shall not bless Him because He's not perverse. He hates those things which are evil, which are wicked. They show us the characteristics of God and how glorious He is. How He is clothed in majesty and beauty. In fact, in Isaiah 6, the prophet Isaiah has a vision. He's allowed to see the Lord. And he says, he recalls in his vision in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. Or excuse me, I'm sorry, verse 3. I'll give you some context. He beholds the Lord seated on His throne in glory, and He sees two angels seated there in heaven. He sees two angels there in heaven, and they, one's crying out to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. That's what He recalls in verse 3. He says, And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. My friends, God, as I have already mentioned, is holy. Separated from that which is evil, and that which is perverse, and that which is wicked. And the Bible says God hates those who mock Him. People say, well, God is love. That's so true. But God is also a God of hatred. And He hates those who mock the gospel. And He hates those who mock the preaching of the gospel. The grace of God is revealed in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to what Psalm 5.5 5 says. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. God's judgment is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Psalm 11 also says God hates the wicked. He hates them. He hates the wicked. And I want to say this also. The law of God not only shows us the character of God, but the character of man in light of the character of God, that he is totally depraved. He is utterly a hater of God and dead in sin. It shows us how wicked we are because we have lied, we have stolen, we have blasphemed, we have trampled God's name underfoot. That we have worshipped other things rather than the Creator God. We are idolaters. This is the state of those who are outside of Christ. Listen. In verse 39 of Romans 1, Paul says, Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, they are gossip, slanderers of God, hey, excuse me, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. Without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. 
And this, the, the result of this, just like if someone here in Greenville County murdered someone else, they must be thrown into prison. God's prison for sinners is eternal hellfire. That is the place of torment for the ungodly. Hell's fires are hot, friends. That's why we come out here to preach to you that you might not be burned to a crisp eternally, but that you might be spared from the wrath of Almighty God. It's coming, friends. God's wrath is coming. Flee the wrath. Come to Jesus Christ in saving faith. Believe upon Christ alone. In Christ alone my hope is found. Can you say that, my friends, about yourselves? Jesus spoke more on hell than he did about heaven. That's true. We have we know more about we we know more about hell from Jesus' teaching than anywhere else in all of the Bible. He was so clear on this. There was no vagueness about this. He was clear. Jesus says in Matthew 25, 46, He says of the ungodly, these will go away into eternal punishment. That is what hell is. God unleashing the full weight and fury of His wrath against sin for all eternity. God unleashing His hatred and His wrath. People think hell is a place where Satan's poking bad guys with a pitchfork in the back. No. God is there and God is administering the punishment. And we are without hope. Jesus described hell as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, the place of outer darkness, the eternal flame, the unquenchable fire. My friends, hell's fires are terrifying. Hell is a scary place. You don't want to go there. Don't die in your sins, friends. Believe Christ's word. We're without hope as well. Every one of us, by default, because of our sin before God, is condemned there to hell. Without hope. Without any hope. And I could go home. I could step down now and that would be my sermon for the night. If Christ had not come. But Christ did come. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. The second person of the Trinity, Almighty God, condescends and takes on human flesh, becomes a man, Jesus of Nazareth, and He fulfills the law that we broke. Those commands we broke, He fulfilled. And then He goes and He dies a bloody death upon a cross. And on that cross, He satisfied the wrath of God the Almighty on that cross. He suffered there as a sacrifice for sin. Isaiah 53, 5, But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him, and by His scourging we are healed. Isaiah 53, 10 says, But it pleased Yahweh to crush Him. It pleased the wrath of God to crush Him. What is hell? Hell is the unleashing of God's wrath upon the ungodly. But what is the cross of Jesus Christ? God unleashing His wrath upon His Son instead of sinners. Do you realize the weightiness of that? The glory of that? That God crushes the innocent instead of the guilty? Have a, have a step down, that God, have you already talked to this man? Okay. And uh, it's, what is it? I, 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 I would like to, but this is so important that I preach to these other people. I, I'll talk with you when I'm done, sir. I do, I'll be done soon. This I will. This is more important. This is much, no, actually mu much more important that souls be saved hear the gospel message. My name is Tim. Yes, sir. Your name? Lucas. Lucas. Tim, nice to meet you. I, please stay. I'd love to talk with you. I'm done. But there's people that need to hear the gospel. My friends, Christ at the cross satisfied God's wrath. God treated His Son. Tony? Think about this. God treated the one who was innocent as though he was guilty. God treated his, his son as if he broke the law which he fulfilled. God looked upon his son as if he lived my life, as if he lived the sinful life that I've lived. That's the glory of the gospel, that Christ satisfies God's wrath. That is the love of God. People want to talk about God's love. What a cheap love that is that people talk about. People talk about God is love, God will forgive you, God is gracious. That's such a cheap love. The biblical God-centered love of the gospel is the love that God showed toward His people by sending His Son into the world to redeem sinful humanity. What does John 3.16 say? 
For God so loved the world. Christ died on that cross because God has a particular redeeming love towards sinners. And it is one that goes to such an extent, to such an end. Think about the death that He underwent. Think about the agony of His soul. The infinite wrath of Almighty God poured out on the, the Son of the Most High. He cried out of the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani. That is why, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Hell is God forsaking the wicked and cutting them off from His gracious presence. What is the cross of Jesus Christ? God cutting off His Son. God cuts off His Son from His presence. This is the beauty of the Christian faith. If you've grown up in church or you've heard from other Christians anything else but this, it's a lie. This is what the Christian faith is about. This is what the Bible is about. This is what the Gospel is about. Jesus Christ atoning work at the cross that He laid Himself down as the Lamb of God. And three days later, He was raised. He did not remain in that tomb. He did not remain in that tomb. He was raised. The Father raised Him up from the grave. Uh, as Romans chapter uh, 4, verse 25 says, He was raised for our justification. It was God saying, I received the sacrifice of My Son. It is pleasing to Me. It is sufficient. It is enough. I will forgive the sins of My people because He suffered there for them. Do you understand how weighty it is that God forgives the guilty. Think about that. A murderer here in Greenville letting, being let off the hook by the judge. Can a judge in here, here in Greenville let a murderer off the hook? Can he do it? Can a judge, can a judge here do it? No. No, he cannot. The, 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 the guilty must be punished. But what? There's only one way. There's only one way. If someone pays the fine, if someone pays the bail, if someone pays the bail for the guilty, they can be let off the hook. The cross of Jesus Christ is Christ paying the bail. He's paying the fine for sin. And so sinners like you and you and me can be let off the hook. We can be forgiven before the just judge of the universe. God can be the just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Think about that. God can forgive you justly because of the work of Jesus Christ but if you reject Amen. there is only God bless you ma'am God bless you sir there is only a fearful expectation of the wrath of God that will consume the adversaries count on it it's gonna come if you reject Christ he comes he dies he's raised and 40 days later after ministering among his disciples appearing to them after being raised from the grave he ex he is he bodily ascends in the glory and he is seated there in heaven at the right hand of majesty on high having completed the work of salvation once for all and Christ is the great high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek he is there reigning and ruling as the God of the universe as the King of glory and He lives to make intercession for those who draw near to God through Him. He lives to make... Listen to that. He lives to make intercession for sinners like you. For sinners as filthy and as wretched as you. So, what must I do to be saved? Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Flee self-confidence. Every other religion in the world, what does it say? Trust in yourself. Try to make yourself good and holy and righteous and, and religious. Try. Try your best. Maybe you'll make it. The Bible says you cannot try. You cannot. Not only can you not make it, but you can't even attempt to make it because you're a hater of God. You're dead in sin. So fall upon the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Cast yourself upon the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and He will not turn you away. Jesus says, for the one who comes to Me, I will by no means cast him out. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for, dear friends? Please, please believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, consider your soul. Consider eternity. Please, Jesus, listen to what He says in Matthew 11. This is so precious. So precious are these words from the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 11, 28. He says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Flee to Christ. Repent. Turn from your sin. Turn from your pornography. Turn from your drunkenness. Turn from your self-righteousness. And turn to the living God. And 
believe that God is able to save you. And here's what will happen. Here's the promise of the gospel. God will forgive you of all your sins. God will forgive you every sin you ever committed because Christ's death on that cross, because of the costly death of the Son of God. And not only that, but God will count you as having lived Christ's life. He will wrap you in the very righteousness of Christ. God will treat you as if you lived Jesus' life. See, that's why He fulfilled the law. That's why Jesus fulfilled the law. So God could credit to the account of sinners His perfect law keeping. That's the exchange of the gospel, my friends. He takes my sin. He takes my filth and my iniquity. And I get His righteousness. I get His perfect robe of righteousness. What are you waiting for? This is a free offer. All of grace. All of grace. All of grace. Come. Come. Look to Christ. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. Oh, friends. Oh, my dear friends. Consider this message. Believe Christ. Promise. And you'll be forgiven of your sin. And you will be clothed. You'll be wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Come. Come. Jesus said, if any man is to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and come after me. My friends, being saved, receiving the gift of salvation is free. But I will say this, if you become a Christian, it will cost you everything. It will cost you your life. It will cost you friendships. It will cost you perhaps your job. It will cost you everything to be in the kingdom of God, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Oh, but my friends, how worth it it is. How worth it. It is. It is all worth it. I can say this. I have lost much for the sake of Christ. I have lost much, my friends, for the sake of Jesus Christ. But it is all worth it. And I count it all but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. He is the pearl of great price. He is precious. He is glorious. He is the all-consuming Savior. He is all-sufficient. If you think you need anything else before God, you're blaspheming the Lord Jesus Christ. He's everything. He's everything to me and He ought to be everything to you. Turn. Look and live. Oh, and you dear saints, if any of you out here know Christ, continue to look. He is your daily bread. He is the bread which came down from heaven. So feed upon Him. My dear brethren, yo, those of you who are in Christ, feed upon Him, for He is the, the nourishment for your souls. Come. Come to Christ before it is too late. So we have seen here in this passage, well, I do want to say this too. I want to say this. Dear friends, this is all to the end that God would be glorified. Salvation, the economy of salvation is to one end, and that is to bring God the glory. It's all for the glory of God. It's not even for us. It's for God. It's for Him. He's jealous. Um, through the prophet Isaiah, he said, I will not give my glory to another. He is jealous for His own glory. That is the end to which salvation, the economy of salvation has been designed. To bring Jesus Christ glory. So friends, believe upon Christ to bring Him glory. Give God the glory for the great things He has done. You sinners, believe and be saved. Be made saints through the cleansing blood of Christ. For all to the glory of God. To God be the glory. The great things that He has done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son who yielded His life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may enter in. Oh my friends, give God the glory for what He has done in Jesus Christ. Come to Christ for the glory of God. To God be the glory indeed. Indeed and indeed. So to recap, we've seen here in Romans 1, verse 28, that just as sinners do not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God eventually gives them over to a depraved mind. And many of you have a depraved mind. Many of you are dead in your sin. 
But look to the one who can raise you to spiritual life. Look to Christ. To Him be glory. I want to end off with a simple passage out of 2 Peter. Excuse me, I'm sorry, 1 Peter. I think it's 1 Peter 3. I think it's 2 Peter, never mind. But my friends, again, as I said, this is all for the glory of God. This is all for God's glory. Listen, this is a quote out of, out of 2 Peter 3, verse 18. Peter speaks to the Christians to whom he wrote. He says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen.
In fact, in Isaiah 6, the prophet Isaiah has a vision. He's allowed to see the Lord. And he says, he recalls in his vision in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. Or excuse me, I'm sorry, verse 3. I'll give you some context. He beholds the Lord seated on His throne in glory and He sees two angels seated there in heaven. He sees two angels there in heaven and they, one's crying out to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. That's what He recalls in verse 3. He says, And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. My friends, God, as I have already mentioned, is holy. Separated from that which is evil, and that which is perverse, and that which is wicked. And the Bible says, God hates those who mock Him. People say, well, God is love. That's so true. But God is also a God of hatred. And He hates those who mock the gospel. And He hates those who mock the preaching of the gospel. The grace of God is revealed in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to what Psalm 5.5 5 says. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. God's judgment is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Psalm 11 also says God hates the wicked. He hates them. He hates the wicked. And I want to say this also. The law of God not only shows us the character of God, but the character of man in light of the character of God, that he is totally depraved. He is utterly a hater of God and dead in sin. It shows us how wicked we are because we have lied, we have stolen, we have blasphemed, we have trampled God's name underfoot. That we have worshipped other things rather than the Creator God. We are idolaters. This is the state of those who are outside of Christ. Listen. In verse 39 of Romans 1, Paul says, Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, they are gossip, slanderers of God, hey, excuse me, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. Without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. And this, the, the result of this, just like if someone here in Greenville County murdered someone else, they must be thrown into prison. God's prison for sinners is eternal hellfire. That is the place of torment for the ungodly. Hell's fires are hot, friends. That's why we come out here to preach to you that you might not be burned to a crisp eternally, but that you might be spared from the wrath of Almighty God. It's coming, friends. God's wrath is coming. Flee the wrath. Come to Jesus Christ in saving faith. Believe upon Christ alone. In Christ alone my hope is found. Can you say that, my friends? about yourselves. Jesus spoke more on hell than he did about heaven. That's true. We have we know more about we we know more about hell from Jesus' teaching than anywhere else in all of the Bible. He was so clear on this. There was no vagueness about this. He was clear. Jesus says in Matthew 25, 46, he says of the ungodly, these will go away into eternal punishment. That is what hell is. God unleashing the full weight and fury of His wrath against sin for all eternity. God unleashing His hatred and His wrath. People think hell is a place where Satan's poking bad guys with a pitchfork in the back. No. God is there and God is administering the punishment. 
and we are without hope. Jesus described hell as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, the place of outer darkness, the eternal flame, the unquenchable fire. My friends, hell's fires are terrifying. Hell is a scary place. You don't want to go there. Don't die in your sins, friends. Believe Christ's word. We're without hope as well. Every one of us, by default, because of our sin before God, is condemned there to hell. Without hope. Without any hope. And I could go home. I could step down now and that would be my sermon for the night if Christ had not come. But Christ did come. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. The second person of the Trinity, Almighty God, condescends and takes on human flesh, becomes a man, Jesus of Nazareth, and He fulfills the law that we broke. Those commands we broke, He fulfilled. And then He goes and He dies a bloody death upon a cross. And on that cross, He satisfied the wrath of God the Almighty on that cross. He suffered there as a sacrifice for sin. Isaiah 53, 5, But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him, and by His scourging we are healed. Isaiah 53, 10 says, But it pleased Yahweh to crush him. It pleased the wrath of God to crush him. What is hell? Hell is the unleashing of God's wrath upon the ungodly. But what is the cross of Jesus Christ? God unleashing His wrath upon His Son instead of sinners. Do you realize the weightiness of that? The glory of that? That God crushes the innocent instead of the guilty? Have you already talked to this man? Okay. And uh, it's, what is it? I, 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 I would like to, but this is so important that I preach to these other people. I, I'll talk with you when I'm done, sir. I do, I'll be done soon. This I will. This is more important. This is mu actually mu much more important that souls be saved hear the gospel message. My name is Tim. Yes, sir. Your name? Lucas. Lucas. Tim, nice to meet you. I, please stay. I'd love to talk with you. I'm done. But there's people that need to hear the gospel. My friends, Christ at the cross satisfied God's wrath. God treated His Son. Johnny? Think about this. God yeah. treated the one who was innocent as though he was guilty. God treated his, his son as if he broke the law which he fulfilled. God looked upon his son as if he lived my life, as if he lived the sinful life that I've lived. That's the glory of the gospel. That Christ satisfies God's wrath. That is the love of God. People want to talk about God's love. What a cheap love that is that people talk about. People talk about God is love. God will forgive you. God is gracious. That's such a cheap love. The biblical God-centered love of the gospel is the love that God showed toward His people by sending His Son into the world to redeem sinful humanity. What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world, Christ died on that cross because God has a particular redeeming love towards sinners. And it is one that goes to such an extent, to such an end. Think about the death that He underwent. Think about the agony of His soul. The infinite wrath of Almighty God poured out on the, the Son of the Most High. He cried out of the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani. That is why, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Hell is God forsaking the wicked and cutting them off from His gracious presence. What is the cross of Jesus Christ? God cutting off His Son. God cuts off His Son from His presence. This is the beauty of the Christian faith. If you've grown up in church or you've heard from other Christians anything else but this, it's a lie. This is what the Christian faith is about. This is what the Bible is about. This is what the Gospel is about. Jesus Christ atoning work at the cross that He laid Himself down as the Lamb of God. And three days later, He was raised. He did not remain in that tomb. He did not remain in that tomb. He was raised. The Father raised Him up from the grave. Uh, as Romans chapter uh, 4, verse 25 says, He was raised for our justification. It, it was God saying, I received the sacrifice of My Son. It is pleasing to Me. It is sufficient. It is enough. I will forgive the sins of My people because He suffered there for them. Do you understand how weighty it is that God forgives the guilty. 
Think about that. A murderer here in Greenville letting, being let off the hook by the judge. Can a judge in here, here in Greenville let a murderer off the hook? Can he do it? Can a judge, can a judge here do it? No. No, he cannot. The, 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 the guilty must be punished. But what? There's only one way. There's only one way. If someone pays the fine, if someone pays the bail, if someone pays the bail for the guilty, they can be let off the hook. The cross of Jesus Christ is Christ paying the bail. He's paying the fine for sin. And so sinners like you and you and me can be let off the hook. We can be forgiven before the just judge of the universe. God can be the just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Think about that. God can forgive you justly because of the work of Jesus Christ but if you reject Amen. there is only God bless you ma'am God bless you sir there is only a fearful expectation of the wrath of God that will consume the adversaries count on it it's gonna come if you reject Christ he comes he dies he's raised and 40 days later after ministering among his disciples appearing to them after being raised from the grave he ex he is he bodily ascends in the glory and he is seated there in heaven at the right hand of majesty on high having completed the work of salvation once for all and Christ is the great high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek he is there reigning and ruling as the God of the universe as the King of glory and He lives to make intercession for those who draw near to God through Him. He lives to make... Listen to that. He lives to make intercession for sinners like you. For sinners as filthy and as wretched as you. So, what must I do to be saved? Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Flee self-confidence. Every other religion in the world, what does it say? Trust in yourself. Try to make yourself good and holy and righteous and, and religious. Try. Try your best. Maybe you'll make it. The Bible says you cannot try. You cannot. Not only can you not make it, but you can't even attempt to make it because you're a hater of God. You're dead in sin. So fall upon the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Cast yourself upon the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and He will not turn you away. Jesus says, for the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast him out. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for, dear friends? Please, please believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, consider your soul. Consider eternity. Please, Jesus, listen to what He says in Matthew 11. This is so precious. So precious are these words from the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 11, 28. He says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Flee to Christ. Repent. Turn from your sin. Turn from your pornography. Turn from your drunkenness. Turn from your self-righteousness. And turn to the living God. And believe that God is able to save you. And here's what will happen. Here's the promise of the gospel. God will forgive you of all your sins. God will forgive you every sin you ever committed because Christ's death on that cross, because of the costly death of the Son of God. And not only that, but God will count you as having lived Christ's life. He will wrap you in the very righteousness of Christ. God will treat you as if you lived Jesus' life. See, that's why He fulfilled the law. That's why Jesus fulfilled the law. So God could credit to the account of sinners His perfect law keeping. That's the exchange of the gospel, my friends. He takes my sin. He takes my filth and my iniquity. And I get His righteousness. I get His perfect robe of righteousness. What are you waiting for? This is a free offer. All of grace. All of grace. All of grace. Come. Come. Look to Christ. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. Oh, friends. Oh, my dear friends. Consider this message. Believe Christ. Promise and you'll be forgiven of your sin, and you will be clothed, you'll be wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Come. Come. Jesus said, if any man is to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and come after me. 
My friends, being saved, receiving the gift of salvation is free. But I will say this, if you become a Christian, it will cost you everything. It will cost you your life. It will cost you friendships. It will cost you perhaps your job. It will cost you everything to be in the kingdom of God, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Oh, but my friends, how worth it it is. How worth it it is. It is all worth it. I can say this. I have lost much for the sake of Christ. I have lost much, my friends, for the sake of Jesus Christ. But it is all worth it. And I count it all but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. He is the pearl of great price. He is precious. He is glorious. He is the all-consuming Savior. He is all-sufficient. If you think you need anything else before God, you're blaspheming the Lord Jesus Christ. He's everything. He's everything to me, and He ought to be everything to you. Turn. Look and live. Oh, and you dear saints, if any of you out here know Christ, continue to look. He is your daily bread. He is the bread which came down from heaven. So feed upon Him. My dear brethren, yo, those of you who are in Christ, feed upon Him, for He is the, the nourishment for your souls. Come. Come to Christ before it is too late. So we have seen here in this passage, well, I do want to say this too. I want to say this. Dear friends, this is all to the end that God would be glorified. Salvation, the economy of salvation is to one end, and that is to bring God the glory. It's all for the glory of God. It's not even for us. It's for God. It's for Him. He's jealous. Um, through the prophet Isaiah, he said, I will not give my glory to another. He is jealous for His own glory. That is the end to which salvation, the economy of salvation has been designed. To bring Jesus Christ glory. So friends, believe upon Christ to bring Him glory. Give God the glory for the great things He has done. You sinners, believe and be saved, be made saints through the cleansing blood of Christ. For all to the glory of God. To God be the glory. The great things that He has done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son who yielded His life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may enter in. Oh my friends, give God the glory for what He has done in Jesus Christ. Come to Christ for the glory of God. To God be the glory indeed. Indeed and indeed. So to recap, we've seen here in Romans 1, verse 28, that just as sinners do not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God eventually gives them over to a depraved mind. And many of you have a depraved mind. Many of you are dead in your sin. But look to the one who can raise you to spiritual life. Look to Christ. To Him be glory. I want to end off with a simple passage out of 2 Peter. Excuse me, I'm sorry, 1 Peter. I think it's 1 Peter 3. I think it's 2 Peter, never mind. But my friends, again, as I said, this is all for the glory of God. This is all for God's glory. Listen, this is a quote out of, out of 2 Peter 3, verse 18. Peter speaks to the Christians to whom he wrote. He says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen.